Okay, welcome everybody. Thanks for watching this video. This is going to be the second video in the five-part regression using R series. And just as a recap, the first video covered simple regression. This one will cover multiple regression. And then the future videos will cover adding categorical predictors, mean centering predictors, and adding interaction terms, which is also referred to as moderation. And so just like with the simple regression video, the format of this is the first half of this video will cover how to uh, do the code in R for a multiple regression analysis. And then the second portion of this video will focus on returning to the PowerPoint to go over how to interpret and write up the results. So the first portion will be applied and the coding section, and then the second portion will be uh, dealing exclusively with how to interpret the results and get the important information that we need. Okay, so here we are in R, and if you are joining us for the first time without uh, watching the simple regression video, uh, just to recap, this is a data set that is linked to on my GitHub page. Uh, it is a prediction of turnover intentions for employees, and uh, specifically we are predicting the degree to which employees want to leave their job or have thought about leaving their job. And so we have a variety of employee level variables that we will be evaluating as possible predictors of turnover intentions. And turnover intentions are measured on a one to five scale where a five means that they are strongly thinking about leaving their job and a one means that they are uh, not thinking about leaving their job. And just as some housekeeping, these are the packages that we're going to use. I know it looks like a lot, but uh, there's, there's some really cool things that we can do with all these different packages. So, if you don't have these installed, you definitely should go ahead and install them. And uh, the, the code that I'm using, the script here, this regression tutorial script, this is posted on my GitHub page as well, along with the data set if you want to follow along. And there's also a code book that explains what all the variables are. So we'll go ahead and load all the packages that we need. Uh, we'll give it a second to run. And then I'm also going to show us the data set really briefly. So this is our turnover measure. This is our outcome variable. And so the name of the data set is turnover, but the variable of interest is also uh, turnover as well. That was a poor decision on my part, but just uh, I'll be sure to specify when I'm talking about the data set and when I'm talking about the specific outcome measure. And then here's all of the different predictors. We have some uh, categorical predictors and some um, numeric predictors. Okay, so going back to the code, uh, I'm going to run these right here. Um, this stuff you don't need to worry about. This is just me turning my categorical variables into factors, which I'll talk about more in the third video where we talk about categorical predictors. So don't worry about this for right now. And then I'm going to go back to the code. And so this is the simple regression portion that we will skip over. And now we'll start here with the multi -regression, multiple regression syntax. And today we're going to be predicting turnover intentions from pay satisfaction and perceptions regarding career opportunity. So specifically, the two variables we're looking at are pay satisfaction, so how satisfied employees are with their pay, and then uh, the, their perceptions of whether or not they have opportunities to advance in their career. So does the degree to which an employee thinks that they have the ability to advance and or pay satisfaction, do those predict whether or not they're going to be willing to, or they're going to want to leave their job or not? So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to take a look at a correlation plot of the numeric variables. And so what you see here is core plot is the function, turnover is the data set, and then here I'm saying every, every row but eliminate the columns that contain the numeric variables. So these numbers are specifying, like the three specifies the third column, the fourth. And this little negative sign is me saying I want to view a correlation matrix for all the variables except the ones that I have in these parentheses and I'm specifying again all them by number right and these are the categorical variables because I don't I can't get a correlation plot for those so we'll go ahead and run that and this is what we get and this is kind of cool you don't need to do this for a regression of course but it's always a good idea to see what variables are correlated with one another before you actually run the regression and so these are all the zero order correlations of the variables with turnover. And so this, where I'm moving my cursor, this is turnover, and these are all the variables. Um, where, wherever you see a variable and then underscore raw or underscore sent, that's just the difference between whether it's measured on the original one to five scale or whether it's been mean centered. 
Uh, don't worry about that yet. We'll talk about that in future videos. We're just using the raw version here. Um, and as you can see, uh, quite a few of the variables are correlated negatively with turnover. So the way this works is that the red indicates a negative correlation, the blue indicates a positive correlation, and the darker the color, the stronger the correlation. So white indicates no correlation or a very weak correlation. So we see right here that we're interested in pay satisfaction, which is right here, pay status raw. And we see that it does have a negative zero order correlation with turnover. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the other variable that we're interested in is perceived career opportunities right here. And that's also negatively correlated with turnover. So this is just kind of cool to, uh, you know, take a look at the correlations amongst your variables before you start. So I'm going to go ahead and clear my plot. Okay, and so now the next thing I might want to do is I might want to take a look at some scatter plots of the relationships between turnover and the variables by themselves. So I'm going to take a look at uh, a scatter plot of turnover predicted from career opportunity by itself, so ignoring pay satisfaction. And again, this isn't strictly necessary, but it's nice to do. And so what I'm doing, what this code does, is I'm saving a plot object, which is just a plot, and I'm using the ggplot function. Turnover is the name of the data set. And then this is where I specify my x variable and my y variable. So if you copy and paste this code, you just need to swap this out with your x variable and this with your y variable. And then uh, add everything else. So we'll go ahead and run this. And then I want to add a regression line with this line of code right here. So I will do that. And then now this last line will run the plot and give us a picture, or sorry, a title rather. And so here's our plot. And I'll zoom in. So this is turnover predicted from career opportunity. The reason we want the regression line is because, as you can see, the scatter plot is pretty uninformative by itself. And that's because our variables are uh, measured on a 1 to 5 scale. So it, the, like each of these dots actually represent a bunch of different values bunched up on top of each other. So it's hard to get a good look at this particular data set and these particular variables without having this regression line. But when we do add the line in, we do see that it does look like turnover is uh, uh, negatively correlated with career opportunities. So the more opportunities you feel you have, the less likely you are to have intentions of quitting. But again, this is just uh, turnover and career opportunity. This isn't the actual multiple regression yet. So now we'll go ahead and get started with the actual multiple regression. So I'll add a comment. This is where the multiple regression model actually starts. And so what we do is we save a model object. So I'm going to call it M2, but you can call it whatever you want. Uh, I like to keep it simple. I already have a M1. That was my uh, the M1 model that we see up here in the top right in my environment. That's where I predicted turnover from just pay satisfaction earlier. So this will be M2, and as you can see, we're going to specify LM for linear model. This is where your Y variable goes. This tilde means that we are predicting uh, the Y from this these X variables. So Y variable, tilde, X1, X2, and then the name of your data set right here. So I am predicting turnover from pace satisfaction and career opportunity, and my data set is turnover. And this fits the regression model, so we'll go ahead and run that. And now you can see in the top right, M2 is saved as a model. And now we can get a summary. And so what this gives us down here in our console is this is our model results. And I'll go over them in the second half of the video, the actual interpretation. But I'll just show you what we're looking at right now. So the important stuff is down here by the coefficients. And so the estimate column, this is the column of our estimates, right? Our co regression coefficients. So this is the intercept. This is the slope, the raw unstandardized slope for pay satisfaction. And this is the unstandardized slope for career opportunity. This is the standard error of each of those estimates. These are the T statistics, and these are the P values. So this is the T statistic and the P value for the hypothesis test of whether or not each of these slopes are significantly different than zero. So are each of these significant predictors of turnover when controlling for the other? but we'll go over more of the interpretation in a little bit. And then down here, we have our R squared value. So it looks like about 18% of the variation in turnover can be explained by our model. Here's the adjusted R squared. Here's our F statistic. And then here's our two different degrees of freedom for that F statistic. And then here's the P value. Okay. 
If we want a confidence interval for the unstandardized slopes, remember the, we have the unstandardized estimates right here. Well, if we want a confidence interval, we can do conf int m2, and you just put the name of your model. For me, it was m2, and this gives us our unstandardized regression coefficients, the confidence interval for them, rather. And we see that right there, if we want to get standardized regression coefficients and a standardized confidence interval, which you always want to get, we can run this line of code that says effect size, and then you put the name of your model, which for us is M2. And so now we see down here that we have standardized coefficient estimates and the, sta uh, the uh, confidence interval for those standardized slopes. And these are also called the beta weights. Okay, and now we'll talk about effect sizes. And again, I'm going to interpret all of this later, so don't worry about that for this minute. Uh, we also might want to get semi-partial correlations and semi-partial squared correlations. And so there's a couple of different ways you can do this. Um, one way you can do this uh, is you can type in ETA at a squared, that's the name of the function, and then your model. So for us, that's M2. So if I run that, uh, this gives me my partial correlations. And then if I, or sorry, I partial squared correlations. And if I want these semi-partials, then I'll specify partial equals false. And so here is the semi-partial effect size or the semi-partial squared correlation for pay satisfaction and for career opportunity. And then here's the confidence intervals for those. So I'll make a comment. This is method one. I don't like this method, though. I highly recommend that you not use this because it gets complicated when you have categorical variables. We'll talk more about that later. The method that I like that makes sense to me is this thing called um, SPCore. That's this function right here. So what I'm doing is I'm saving a correlation matrix of semi-partial correlations, and I'm saying SPCore, that's the function. Here's the name of my data set, so you'll put in whatever the name of your data set is. I leave a blank to specify that I want all of my rows, but then the only columns that I want for my, my correlation matrix are, are, sorry, the only variables I want, excuse me, the only variables for, for my data frame are the variables that I'm interested in. Because otherwise, if you don't do this, it'll just give you the semi-partial correlations for everything. It'll act like you're trying to predict turnover from everything. So I say turnover, pay satisfaction, career opportunity. So you just specify your Y and your X variables. And so when you do this, this makes a semi-core matrix, and then you can view it by typing semi-core and running that. And then up here, when you scroll up, here's the estimates. So these are the estimates of these semi-partial correlations. Now, we usually want the semi-partial squared, or at least I usually do. You don't have to. And so all you need to do is you come down here, and you just say a new object, semi-core square, and what you do is you type in semi-core, which is the name of our semi-correlation matrix, and then dollar sign estimate to know that we want to pull the estimate. Uh, whoops. Yeah, we want to pull the estimate, and then this, this caret 2 means squared. So this is just saying that make a new matrix that is the squared semi-correlation matrix. And to make this matrix, we want to pull the just the, the non-squared matrix, we pull the estimate from it, and square it. So we'll do that, and then the last thing we'll want to do is when we type in, the, uh, we can view this semi-partial squared correlation matrix that we just made, but if we just type it in, then we get, you know, the entire matrix, right? If we want to just get the semi-partials for turnover predicted from our variables, then you just type in semi-core square, and then type in turnover, because that's your y variable, so, and then a comma to denote that you want the row that corresponds to turnover predicted from everything else. And when we do that, we, whoops, uh, sorry. When we do that, it's just this line of code. When we do that, here it is, this is what we were looking for. These are the semi-partial squared. So the semi-partial squared for pay satisfaction is 0 0.048, and for career opportunities is 0 0.073. And then when we come back up to our uh, original estimates, you can see that they're slightly different than if we had used the uh, eta squared for the model, like that, that other method, right? So uh, this is why it's important to uh, just make sure of which methods you're doing, right? Because you might get slightly different results, but we'll talk more about that later. So anyways, long story short, you have a couple different ways of getting your semi-partial squared. Uh, if you just want to do the easiest way, you can just do 
this line of code right here. Um, but again, I prefer to do the slightly longer version, but I think that it's uh, a little more, uh, it's a little better in the long run, but user choice. Anyways, this was how you get the effect sizes. So now another thing we can do is we might want to get a visualization of the regression. And what I mean by that is this is actually really, really cool. You type in scatter 3D and then your Y variable tilde predicted from both of your X variables and then your data set. So when you do this, what this does is, give me one sec. Okay, I had to find it. It pops up down here. So what it does is it makes this thing, and this is super cool. You can actually move this around. This is a regression plane of, of your variables, right? Because remember, when you have more than one predictor, you can't just plot it in two dimensions, like, a, you know, because we have, we have three dimensions now. We have two X variables and then our, our uh, variable of interest up here at the top. So we can see career opportunities down here. And then as we rotate, we see pay satisfaction. And then we can see how these predict turnover. And so you can do this for two predictors at a time, because any more than that would be four dimensions, right? But this is really cool because we can see what this is showing us, this regression plane. This is the uh, plane of, of predicted values or our regression plane, you know, predicting turnover from pay satisfaction and career opportunities. So what we can see is we see, if we look at just career opportunities, as we go down in career opportunities, because this starts at five and goes down to one, as we go down in career opportunities, then turnover increases, controlling for pay satisfaction. And then as we rotate over to pay satisfaction, as we go down in pay satisfaction, turnover increases. So both of these are negatively uh, negative predictors of turnover. And so basically, as pay satisfaction increases, turnover decreases. Or as we just said, as pay satisfaction decreases, turnover increases. And that makes intuitive sense. But this is a really cool visualization. And what these lines are is these are the, the little yellow dots are the actual observed values, and these lines are the residuals. And so this can really show you how to visualize what multiple regression actually looks like. And I just think this is super cool. And this really helps me understand what controlling for means. So when we say that we're controlling for something, well, okay, this axis right here is pay satisfaction. The axis going this way is career opportunity. So if we control for pay satisfaction, what we're saying is if we were to fix our pay satisfaction on any value, so let's just say right here where my cursor is, then if we were to stay at this level of pay satisfaction and control for this level of pay satisfaction, we can see that as we increase turnover opportunities, or sorry, as we increase career opportunities, turnover decreases, right? Because this plane is sloping down. So again, controlling for pay satisfaction, staying at this level of pay satisfaction, turnover will decrease as career opportunities increases because when we move this direction, we are increasing in career opportunities and this progression plane is sloping downwards. So again, controlling for pay satisfaction, increases in career opportunities will decrease turnover. And we can do the same, or the, the inverse rather, right? We can come over here to our career opportunity scale. Sorry, this is a little janky to move the mouse around. Okay, so if we stay at one level of career opportunities, like where my cursor is, controlling for career opportunities as we increase in pay satisfaction, so moving down this progression plane, we can see that turnover decreases as pay satisfaction increases because uh, we, the, the regression plane is slowing as it's sloping down. So this is a really cool visualization of what controlling for things means and what multiple regression actually looks like. And again, the way we got that was by this line of code right here. So you specify your Y variable and then your X variable, and you can do up to two of them at a time. It won't work if you only have one X variable, but it won't, also won't work if you have more than two. So you can only specify exactly two predictors at a time. Another thing we can do is we can get a slightly prettier version of our model summary because it, it, like when we saw when we ran just 
the default summary, right? We get this kind of ugly looking thing. Well, you can run this line of code right here and do outreg, say your model, and then say type equals HTML. And what this will do if we run it is it will pop up a prettier version. It's not an APA format, but it's cleaner looking than the other one. And so this is our intercept estimate. And then in parentheses, we have the standard error. And then the stars represent whether or not it's significant. And then we have our other information here too. Okay, so we have fit our model. We've gotten our effect sizes. We've gotten our coefficients, our standardized coefficients, our confidence intervals. We've gotten a nice table. Uh, the next thing we might want to do is we might want to say, well, okay, this regression model examined whether or not career opportunities and pay satisfaction simultaneously predict turnover intentions. But we might want to say, well, does adding career opportunity predict turnover intentions above and beyond pay satisfaction? So in other words, if we look at model one, which I fit in the first video down here in the bottom, I'm typing summary model one. Okay, this model, as we can see, only looked at pay satisfaction. So we saw pay satisfaction was a significant predictor of turnover, and it accounted for about 12% of the variation in turnover. Well, we can now say if we compare the model with career opportunity and pay satisfaction to the model that just has pay satisfaction, was there a significant change in uh, R squared, or did we significantly increase our model fit or our predictive ability, our ability to predict turnover intentions. So what you can do is you can, uh, uh, you, you have to have your simpler model already specified. So again, earlier in the first video, I did M1 equals LM turnover predicted from just pay satisfact. So you have to have this simpler model already speci specified. But once you do that, right, once I, once I have that, then you can come here and you can type in ANOVA and then your second model and your first model. And what this will do is this will test whether or not the change in model fit between the simpler model and the model with both predictors or more predictors significantly improved uh, the R squared value. And so, or um, another way of saying that, did it significantly decrease the error sums of squares? So basically, again, this is just saying instead of just putting both predictors in at the same time, can we specifically evaluate whether or not adding career opportunity predicts turnover intentions above and beyond pay satisfaction? So this is only necessary if you specifically want to see if one variable predicts above and beyond another. Okay, and what we see here in this output is that model one was turnover uh, intention predicted from pay satisfaction and career opportunity, and then model two is turnover predicted from just pay satisfaction. And so what we see is that this is the residual sums of squares for the simpler model. This is the residual sums of squared, or sorry, the top one is the residual sums of squares for the more complex model. This is the sums of squares residual for the, for the simpler model. But what we see is that we have less error when we add in career opportunity, add in our second predictor. This will always be the case, but we want to see if this significantly decreased, if the error got significantly improved. And this tells us that it does, because this is an F test of the change in sums of squares error, the change in the reduction in error. And what we see is that uh, our, F statistic, our F statistic, our F test is significant. So we can say that adding career opportunity does predict turnover intentions above and beyond pay satisfaction it, that because that change in r squared is significant the other thing we can do too is we can run a relative weights analysis a lot of people aren't familiar with this this is relatively um you know still relatively uncommon but what you can do here is you can specify your data frame so for me that was the turnover data frame then type in this symbol this is a pipe and then we type in RWA, that's the function. You specify what your outcome is, so for turnover. Then you say what your predictors are. So for us, it was pay satisfaction and career opportunity. And when you do this, what this is, is you can scroll up right here to the result portion. And this says two things. The raw relative weight says the proportion of the overall variation in turnover that's explained by pay satisfaction and by career opportunity 
So we see that 8% is explained by pay satisfaction, 10.5% uh, is explained by career opportunity. And then you can also look at the rescaled relative weight. And this is cool because this shows us out of, it says out of the variation in turnover intentions that's explained by the model. So out of your total 18% of turnover intention variation that's explained by your model, out of that variation that's explained, 43% of it is explained by pay satisfaction and 56% of it is explained by career opportunities. And so this can be used as a variable importance measure. This shows us that both variables are pretty close to uh, the, uh, one another in terms of their importance and their uh, percentage of turnover intentions explained. Uh, it looks like career opportunity explains a little bit more variation than pay satisfaction. And again, this is called a relative weights analysis. So this first one shows out of all the variation in turnover intentions, what percent is explained by each uh, predictor. And then the second column, the rescaled one, says out of just the variation that is explained in turnover intentions, what proportion is explained by pay satisfaction, what proportion is explained by career opportunities. Okay, then the last thing is we need to look at our regression diagnostics our, our, uh, to test our model assumptions. Because remember, we assume that the errors at the population level are independent and distributed normally around a mean of zero with a constant error variance or a homoscedastic error variance. So we look at residual plots because remember the residuals are the version or like the uh, sample version of errors, right? We don't look at errors in our sample data. We look at residuals. And so we can look at these plots. So the easiest way to do this is just to type plot in the new model. And then when you run it, you have to put your cursor down here because there's multiple plots and you press enter to see each one. So this first one, what we would like to see is we would like to see something where, uh, like see how this kind of slopes down, uh, the, this pattern of residuals. We would like to see it to where the, it doesn't slope down, right? It's just completely relatively flat across. Um, and this red line, this is kind of showing whether or not there is a slope to our pattern of residuals uh, across different fitted values or different predicted values. So this isn't too bad, right? Because this red line is still relatively straight, but ideally we'd like to see this, um, like not, not have this slope to it. Uh, and what this, what, but the other thing we're looking for is we're looking to see if the spread, this vertical spread of our residuals is constant as we proceed from left to right, or as we conditional upon different fitted values. So we want to see is the error variance homoscedastic or constant across different fitted values. This is called conditional, uh, or con constant, <laughs> conditional, like, uh, in, in a, there's like some term for it. Uh, it basically, you just want to see conditional upon different fitted values. Is your error variance constant? And again, the way we evaluate that is by the spread, the vertical spread of the residuals. And we can see that ours looks relatively constant, except for once we get down here to our lower fitted values and our, or our lower predicted values. We'll press enter again to see the next plot. This is a QQ plot of whether or not your residuals are distributed normally. If they were perfectly normally distributed, then all of these residual dots would be perfectly on this dotted line. But you can see as we get towards the more extreme ends of our expected uh, quantiles for our residual values, they start to deviate from this dotted line. They don't fit perfectly flush on this diagonal line. This isn't really bad. Uh, but ideally, we'd want it to see it perfect. But it does look like our model maybe doesn't perform as well uh, for the more extreme uh, predicted values of turnover intentions. Press enter again. And so this is looking at the um, uh, another measure of looking at the square root of the absolute value of standardized residuals plotted against the fitted values. And the main thing with all these plots is we don't want to see a pattern. Uh, we don't want to see like a, a really sloped line or a curved line. We just want to see constant patterns of residuals. And so um, our, our specific model isn't great, but it's not awful either. And then this last one, this shows us uh, a plot of influence. And specifically, it's looking at the standardized residuals plotted against leverage. And I'll explain that more in another uh, section of this presentation. And then the other thing we can do is this is how we did all of the base R 
plots, these, these uh, non-pretty plots, we can run these to get prettier versions of what we just looked at. And so you just put, uh, run this code and then put your model in, inside of the parentheses for each of these plots. And so I'll run these all at once. Whoops. Okay. And so let me go back to the first one. And so here we see uh, the same thing we saw, but a prettier version. And this is a histogram of the residuals, so this is uh, new as well. And I'll go over these in more detail in a minute. And then the other thing we can do is we can check for multicollinearity by looking at the variance inflation factors. This is to see if our predictors are uh, overly correlated with one another. So we do VIF and then the model, M2. And down here at the bottom, this is the variance inflation uh, factor for each of our predictors. As long as this isn't a large value, you're fine. And typically, you just don't want it to be really above 5. Um, some people say that's conservative. You definitely don't want it to be above 10. Uh, but anything below 5 is, is perfectly fine. And then once you get in the 5 to 10 range, it's not great, but it's not necessarily a problem either. Again, different people say different things but you definitely want it to be under 10 and as close to zero or one, I mean, sorry, as close to one as possible. And then we can also test directly whether or not we actually have homogeneity of error variance instead of just looking at our plots. Um, these tests, I don't really like all that much because they're susceptible to sample size, but they're still useful sometimes, so I'll show you how to do it. You type in NCV test in the model, and down here at the bottom, what this is saying is whether or not the variance is significantly different across your different fitted values, right? Because our assumption is that the var error variance is constant across fitted values. And here it shows that it does appear that it's significantly different. But keep in mind, we do have a relatively large sample size, and these tests, you know, are prone to sample size influence. So this is a, if you get a significant result from this, it doesn't mean you have to throw your model out. Uh, but again, as I noted earlier, we don't have the uh, our, our model doesn't perfectly fit the assumptions as much as we'd like it to. And then finally, if you do have error variance that is not constant, so if your assumption is definitely violated, then you can get coefficient estimates that uh, use what's called a sandwich estimator, right? They, they correct for the fact that uh, your your error variance is not constant. So we'll run COEF test and then the name of our model. And down here, we get our revised significance test. Because here's the thing, if your assumptions are violated, your estimates aren't different, the thing that changes is the significance test because the standard error of your estimates is what's affected by violation of your assumptions. So your estimates for your coefficients, your slopes and such, are still fine, but what changes is the significance test results, right? Because the standard error can be biased if your assumptions aren't met. And so what this test does is this gives us a significance test for our coefficients that accounts for the fact that our standard errors are biased because our assumptions aren't met. And as we can see, even after correcting for uh, error variance that isn't constant, we still have significant uh, coefficients for both of our predictors. So even if our error variance isn't, uh, even if the assumption of constant error variance isn't met, our, our predictors would still be significant in terms of their significance test. Okay, and so now we'll go over the results and how we might want to format them. And so everything I'm about to show you, the information came from what we just saw in R. So what I like to do is I like to make a table to present my results. It's the easiest way instead of worrying about uh, ty typing these like overly fancy paragraphs. I just like to put everything in a table and then say, as seen in table one, this predictor was significant or blah, 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 blah. But a table is the easiest way for me personally. And this table is an APA format for the most part, except for the borders, um, if you did want to, uh, if that's it's something that's important to you. So here we see multiple regression, turnover predicted from pay satisfaction career opportunity. Here's our predictor variables. Here's our unstandardized slopes, the little b. Here's our standardized slopes. Here's the p-value for the significance tests. 
Here's the confidence interval for these standardized slopes. Here's our semi-partial squared values. And here's our, our rescaled raw relative weights. So I got all this information from everything we looked at. And then here's the R squared value for our model. And so I'll go over this. This is the same table. Uh, the predicted level of turnover intentions for individuals with zero pay satisfaction and zero uh, perceived career opportunity is 4.05. That's the interpretation of our intercept. For the slopes, we can say for every one unit increase in pay satisfaction, turnover intention is predicted to decrease by 0 0.28 units controlling for career opportunity. Another way of saying the same thing that some people prefer to use, uh, this is the phrasing that some people prefer to use to say the same thing, is comparing employees who have the same perceived career opportunities but who differ by one unit on pay satisfaction. We would expect or predict a difference in turnover intentions of negative 0.28 units. These two bullet points say the same thing. It's just the interpretation of the slope for pay satisfaction. And then for career opportunity, we just say for every one unit increase in perceived career opportunity, turnover intent is, is predicted to decrease by 0.3 units when controlling for pay satisfaction. Or comparing employees of the same pay satisfaction, but who differ by one unit on perceived career opportunities, we would expect a difference in turnover intentions of, zero, of negative 0.3 units. And then the standardized slope interpretation is for every one standard deviation increase in pay satisfaction, turnover intentions are predicted to decrease by 0 0.24 standard deviations when controlling for perceived career opportunities. This is our standardized slope interpretations. And then the same thing for uh, career opportunity when controlling for pay satisfaction. All right, now moving on to the semi-partial squared which is this column right here. The interpretation is of all the variation in turnover intentions, about 4.8% is uniquely explained by pay satisfaction, and about 7.3% is uniquely explained by perceived career opportunities. And again, that's these right here. So that's saying of all the variation in turnover intentions, about 4.8% is uniquely explained by pay satisfaction and then the, for career opportunity. Okay, and then for the rescaled raw relative weights, this says of the variation in turnover intentions explained by the model, about 44% is explained by pay satisfaction and about 57% is explained by perceived career opportunities. So ex uh, perceived career opportunities explains a little bit more, but they're roughly equivalent in terms of how important they are in explaining turnover. And then finally, for the R squared, we say roughly 19% of the variation in turnover intentions can be explained by the model, including these two predictors. And this was our comparison of when we wanted to uh, compare if adding career opportunity predicted turnover intentions above and beyond pay satisfaction instead of just the simultaneous interpretation where we enter them both at the same time and, and don't compare it to the earlier model. So we call this a nested, or some people say hierarchical model comparison. I prefer nested model because hierarchical model can get confusing, right? That's something different later. And so this is just a copy of the results we already talked about. So this shows that does adding perceived career opportunities to the model containing pay satisfaction significantly increase model fit or significantly decrease error? And we see that it does, right? It is a uh, adding career opportunity does significantly reduce our residual sums of squares. And this was just the visual that we talked about earlier. And here's our diagnostic plot. So again, we see that our residuals do appear to be relatively normally distributed around zero. We see that from both the histogram and the QQ plot. Um, we do see a pattern here that we don't like, but it does look like Except for our really small fitted values, it does look like the vertical spread or the variance of our residuals does appear to be constant across the different fitted values from left to right. So again, we're looking to see if that vertical spread uh, maintains that a similar spread, not the absolute like location in terms of how uh, where it's plotted on the y-axis, but the actual spread. 
So that appears constant except for these lower values. So in real life, what you would probably want to do is you could try some transformations of your variables to see if maybe like uh, you can get these residuals to uh, uh, your assumptions to be better met. Um, but in this case, it didn't matter for us because when we used our our uh, test of significance to see if you know violations of the assumptions would change our significance results, it did not. Right. Um, and again. It won't, if your assumptions are violated, it won't change the estimates, it'll change the standard error bias and that will uh, potentially affect your significance test. Um, but this isn't the worst uh, plot that I've ever seen either. But ideally we, we would want this to be uh, flat instead of sloped down and we would want this spread to be consistent. And then lastly, we have a plot of studentized residuals. What studentized residuals look at uh, or deleted studentized residuals is they basically uh, compute each of your residuals by using an error variance that you would get if you deleted each observation. And so what it's looking to see is if any of these observations are potential outliers in terms of, hey, if we didn't have this observation in our data set, our error variance would change by a lot or not. And so what this does is when it calculates the standardized or the studentized residual, it's dividing each residual by an error variance that is computed by saying, okay, if this observation was not here, what would the error variance be? So it's just a measure basically of uh, outlier status. And this red line is looking to see if any of the values exceed a threshold or an absolute value of three, a studentized residual absolute value of three, and all of ours are within this threshold. So uh, it does not look like we have outliers by this measure. And that concludes this portion. And next time we'll talk about mean centering. As always, the code can be found on my GitHub page. The link is in the description and on my about page. Uh, and the same with the data set and a description of the variables. And if you have any questions, please be sure to ask in the comments. And if you see any mistakes, be sure to let me know as well, uh, because I certainly make my fair share of mistakes. Have a great day.